Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, this is going to be, I guess, a part two of Thoughts on 666. Uh, a few people commented and says, well, you know, I'm not convinced it's going to be a physical mark. Maybe it's spiritual. Personally, I think it's going to be both. I mean, you know, the King James Bible says in the right hand, and all the modern Bibles say on. Um, you know, but it's it's basically in a nutshell, think about this. Are we going to depend upon the beast system for our existence, or are we going to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, if you can't buy or sell, you know, the B system cuts you off. Uh, are we going to acquiesce to the beast and take the mark? Or are we going to trust Jesus either in the wilderness or possibly die for the faith? Uh, that is basically going to be an overall thing. But let's talk about some other things first. Somebody sent me an article. Uh, it was written a couple years ago, Forbes, Forbes magazine, about how Harvard, which has a, a an antichrist for a president, uh, yeah, Harvard, the uh, originally a Bible college, now has a antichrist for the president and has a an elective on anal sex. Yeah, used to be a Bible college. Now it's a, a den of devils. But uh, they did an article for Forbes where they were partnering with the government to spray things in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight to counteract the effects of global warming. Well, guess what? Global warming is absolutely true. But it's not the way that the government is telling us it is. See, global warming is not going to be a slow thing. It's going to be a sudden event. How about 2 Peter chapter 3? Now, you're going to re meet devils. They're going to tell you, oh, well, Peter never wrote 2 Peter. That's a fake book. Why? Because it acknowledges Paul as a brother in the faith. And the devils hate Paul's words. But we're not reading Paul. So, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 records the following. Global warming. Here we go. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. What does it mean to be ignorant? It means you don't know something. You know, when it comes to calculus and higher levels mathematics, I am totally ignorant. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, some of the greatest uh, scholars that I know believe that the earth is about 6,000 years old based on population after the flood and, uh, you know, from the time of uh, creation to now, judging the generations from Abraham to Christ and from Christ to now. They say it's about 6,000 years. Well, if the Lord made everything in six days, and then on the seventh day rested, the Sabbath, and a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, well, six thousand years, uh, we should be coming up on the seventh day in the Lord's eyes, right? Which is his Sabbath. And what does the Bible talk about? The millennium. Oh, wow, Chaplain Bob, yeah. Now, what the heck are you talking about, Chaplain Bob? You're messing me up here. Oh, well, 
Revelation chapter 20. Now remember, Christ is returning. That's what 2 Peter's about. That's what Revelation chapter 20 is about. Verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So Satan's going to be chained up, locked up, locked away in the bottomless pit. Verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon it, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Ah, thousand years. Is this God's Sabbath? I think so. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Wow. Sounds like the Great Tribulation, doesn't it? And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. See, there is a spiritual application to this, but there's also a physical application. So, verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. There's only two resurrections. There's the resurrection when Christ returns, that's the just, that's the righteous, well, those who have their righteousness in Christ, okay? Our, our righteousness, and especially me, uh, is like filthy rags. But uh, you better have on his righteousness, you know, the robe, the robe washed in his blood, the white robe washed in his blood, that's what you better have. So that is the first resurrection. When Christ returns, everybody is resurrected from the dead, and those that didn't die will be transformed. Satan's locked up for a thousand years, and then at the end of the thousand years, uh, there's the second resurrection that's for the damned. Uh, probably the first resurrection will be the judgment seat of Christ, where everybody will be judged uh, and given their rewards, if they get a reward. I don't know. But the second resurrection, that's the, the white throne judgment. That's bad news for the wicked. For the wicked, it's bad news. So, all right, Revelation 20, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Ah. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Uh, two things here. After Satan's... Uh, 
released after a thousand years, who's he deceiving here? And who is he getting these people to to have a war against the camp of the saints with the New Jerusalem? My opinion is all the children that died in childbirth, those that were aborted, those that died at a young age, um, before they reached the age of accountability, which I kind of believe that 20 is the age of accountability because a male could not go to war in the Bible, in the Old Testament, until they were 20 years old. Then they were considered a full adult. That's my opinion. Um, the Lord might have a different idea. I don't know. You know, if a kid dies at 19 years old, I don't know. But, you know, a three-year-old that dies from scarlet fever or smallpox or the bubonic plague, the black death, you know, isn't the Lord going to give them a new body and a chance to grow up in this millennial kingdom without Christ? I mean, without Satan to interfere with the plans of Christ? Boy, that was a... Sorry, Lord, I didn't mean that. But uh, they're going to grow up with Christians teaching them and training them. But then Satan's going to be released and it'll be like before when there was a war in heaven. You know, that's why Satan got kicked out. There was a war in heaven. Read Revelation 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And then they were cast out to the earth. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. For the dragon has come down unto you with great wrath. Uh, that's the Bob paraphrase. So, so all these kids that grow up, um, they're going to be, a lot of them are going to be fooled by Satan. They're going to go to war against the saints, the camp of the saints, New Jerusalem, fire is going to come down, wipe them out. Uh, so the devil's going to get thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, where they're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Uh, the only ones that I know that get tormented forever and ever in hell is the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. Everybody else, I don't know. Um, I've heard some people say, oh yeah, they're going to be tormented forever and ever. Others I've heard, they're going to be annihilated, just destroyed. You know, I don't know. Really, I don't think it's that big of a deal to argue over because my thing is to get, try to warn people, you know, don't take the mark. Don't deny Christ. If, you, if you're called to die for the faith, that's what the Lord wants you to do. Some of us are going to have to die for the faith uh, as a witness to others, you know? And the Holy Spirit's going to speak through some people. That's in Matthew 24. I should take a look at that. Um, we'll look at that. Dying for the faith. Some of us are going to be a witness, just like Stephen. I don't know if you've read the book of Acts, but if you had, uh, Stephen was telling a story to the um, unbelieving you-know-whos. And Paul, Paul uh, Saul, who was later to become Paul the Apostle, was there and listened to his speech, you know? And then they stoned him to death. And no, it wasn't with great weed either, so. And the devil deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Um, you know, people are going to be judged by their works. You know, your, your faith is by grace. But if we get a reward in heaven, it's going to be because of our works. 
Um, those that are faithful in much, uh, we'll take a look at that real quick. All right, let's, you know, a lot of this information I've done in previous studies, but I'm trying to get the last part in before maybe tube deletes. I don't know. All right, Luke 19, verse 12. Jesus speaking. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Who's a certain nobleman? It's Christ. Christ the king. Where, where's the far country? Heaven. So he's receiving a kingdom and to return. Well, he's going to come back to earth one day. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Boy, tell that to the pre-trib rapture crowd. They're like, no, we're not going to occupy. We're going to fly away. We're going to fly away. Yee! No, Christ told us to occupy till I come. Verse 14, but his citizens hated him. Wow. And sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. What? You don't want the nobleman to reign over you to rule? And we're not talking about water falling from the sky. No, reign as in rule. So who is this that didn't want the king? Well, let's hit John chapter 19 real quick. Verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Well, guess what? This right there is proof that the New Testament was written in Greek. Because if, you know, it's telling you, in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Well, if the Bible, the New Testament was written in Hebrew, it wouldn't need to tell you this, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. You know, if, if it was in Hebrew and everybody spoke Hebrew, they'd know what it means. No, it's in Greek. Greek was the common language of commerce in the days of the Romans because Alexander the Great had conquered virtually the entire world. Rome was a newcomer. They'd only recently conquered uh, Greece. Why? Because uh, Alexander's four generals split the empire up into four parts, and then they fought each other like a bunch of idiots. You know? And what did Jesus say? A house divided against itself cannot stand. And that's exactly what happened. They could never, probably, Rome could probably have never have conquered if they hadn't done it. But, you know, the Lord's in charge. So, verse 14. So, Pilate brings Jesus forth. Verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king the nobleman. But they, the Jews, but they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, and no, these are not Catholic priests, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Oh. Let's go back to Luke 19. So, 
a certain, verse 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him. His citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he had returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound have gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, thou ha uh, have thou authority over ten cities. See, the servant was faithful and had gained much, and the Lord gave him authority over ten cities. He was to be the, I guess, the prince ruler over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. What does that austere mean? It means a harsh, hard man. So he says, Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest thou that, uh, and reapest thou that uh, that thou didst not sow. So the Lord's going to take up things that He didn't lay down, and He's going to reap things that He didn't sow. Why? Because it was other people's jobs. Other evangelists are supposed to sow, and then, you know, the Lord is going to have his angels reap the harvest at the end of the world, right? So what is Jesus' answer? Well, 22. Luke 19, 22. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knowest that I was an austere man, Oh, so you know I'm a hard, harsh guy, huh? Really? I'm going to show you just how harsh and hard I can be here. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? Now, the Bible records that you're not supposed to give uh, take usury from your brother. So he's telling him, my opinion here is, he's telling him, you know, you should have at least broken my law so that I got a little something extra from what I gave you. Now, I don't think it's money here, but I don't know. I think it's a spiritual application, but then I don't know. Verse 24, And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. And the Bob commentary would be, Lord, he's already got ten. You're going to give him another one? Eleven? Well, yeah, because he was faithful and this other guy was worthless. So take it from him and give it to the guy that's faithful. Verse 26. For I say unto you that unto every one that which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. Listen carefully. Verse 27. 
but those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. What? Chaplain Bob, you're, you're reading that horrible King James Bible. What's wrong with you? That's not what it says in the original Greek. God's a loving God. He would never do that. He loves everybody. Really? I don't think so. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me? Whoo boy, that's some harsh words, huh? Oh yeah, big doggy. You know, it says in Matthew 12, 37, for by our, uh, I'm sorry, for by thy words, thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned remember you deny Christ Christ will deny you we'll probably cover that again but all right let's go back to Revelation chapter 20 verse 12 and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened. So you got the book of life, and then you got another book. I wonder if this other book, now I'm guessing, I don't know. I'll be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know what this other book is. But I wonder if this book is records our works either good or bad. Boy, when the Lord gets to me, he's going to have an encyclopedia there of a lot of bad stuff. Yeah, a lot. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, plural, so there's the book of life, and then there's another book. According to their works. The guy that got the 10, you know, was given one pound and, and got 10 more. Well, got 10. He's going to be given rulership over 10 cities. Think about that. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Boy, I'll tell you what. There's going to be a lot of dead American sailors that died in World War II. A lot. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. I don't know how many of you studied um, World War II history. But for the first six months of the war, after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, uh, I guess the modern way to say it was America was getting their butt kicked. We The, the Japanese were just... Well, in World War, at the beginning of World War II, the three largest navies in the world were England, the United States, and Japan, in that order. After Pearl Harbor, England had the top navy in the world, and Japan was number two. U.S. was probably third. We lost a lot of ships in Pearl Harbor. And they attacked the Philippines, too, which we lost ships there, too. Um, so... But for the first six months, we were getting our butts whipped bad. I mean, the Japanese had really, I, to my knowledge, had not lost a single battle, land, air, or sea. And then came the Battle of Midway. And you know what? Personally, I think we won that war. Not so much because the... Uh, they had, the United States had broken 
the codes of the Japanese and knew where the attack was going to be. My opinion is there was a bunch of praying Christians. That's my opinion. Because we should have lost the Battle of Midway. We should have lost. I mean, the Japanese fleet was just tremendously so much larger. And it was an incredible victory. There was like seven or eight attacks were, uh, against the uh, Japanese fleet that failed, one after another after another. But it was the very last one, the last ditch effort, where the dive bombers found the ships and in basically five minutes or less there were three aircraft carriers of the Japanese Navy burning. That was approximately 40% of their uh, naval air power and they lost a lot of pilots, they lost a lot of planes and the thing about an aircraft carrier uh, you know, all those planes are loaded up with aviation fuel, aviation gasoline, which is, you know, super premium gasoline, highly flammable and explosive. And the thing is, is uh, a bomb is just basically um, a very, very, very fast explosion. Um, well, a fire. A bomb, an explosion is just a, a very, very, very fast fire that heats up everything and causes the air to expand. That's what causes the uh, explosion. But the thing is, you know, aircraft carriers are full of uh, bombs and torpedoes and uh, gasoline, high-octane aviation fuel for the planes. And when the bomb goes off, the, the, the gasoline tanks would burst. The gas spreads everywhere. It catches fire, and then you got a fire underneath your bombs and your torpedoes. One of those aircraft carriers was blown in two because all the bombs and torpedoes started blowing up. And then it happened to another one. And, and the other one just, you know, was burning from one end to the other. Because let me tell you something, when gasoline starts catching fire, it just doesn't sit in one spot, it spreads. And uh, the Japanese couldn't put the fires out. But I believe that there were Christians praying for protection and victory. I honestly believe that. And like I mentioned in uh, part one of this study, that, uh, you know, America still had some godly people in World War II. Women dressed fairly modestly. They wore hair coverings. There were people going to churches. Churches are closing people. Do you know England, all, a lot of their churches, many of their churches, are being turned into mosques. Because they're empty. Well, they don't preach the truth. So they sell them to the Muslims to, and turn it into a mosque and rededicate it to Allah, the God of Kabbalah, I believe. So, Revelation 20, verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right, let's go back to Second Peter. Remember, we were talking about global warming, remember? Verse 8, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. What's the purpose of the millennium? The children to grow up, to be tested and tried like we all are going to be. 
and then um, Satan's going to be released, and then people are going to have to decide, am I going to follow the Lord, or am I going to follow the devil? A lot of them are going to follow the devil, because that's what it is with the flesh. That's the purpose of the millennium. I've got a Bible study on children in the kingdom. Yeah. And pre-tribbers uh, can never figure that one out. They think that, uh, well, never mind what they think. They're wrong. Because the Bible records that there's going to be children in the kingdom. But in... Um, Jesus says that uh, in the resurrection there will neither be marriage nor giving in marriage, but we will be like the angels in heaven. And that doesn't mean that the angels can't have sex, because not all the angels are in heaven. Some of them were cast out. And that's a reference to Genesis 6, by the way. But the thing is, in the resurrection... We ain't going to be getting married. And we ain't going to be having kids. But those children that grow up probably will. Well, either that, either they'll have children or they'll be born as children. Because there's a thing in Ezekiel where it talks about the, the kingdom where the... Oh, let's take a look at that real quick. Uh, let's see. All right, it's in, um, sometimes I have to pause these studies and uh, look stuff up, which this King James Bible Online is pretty good. Um, sometimes their, their search is not complete. But in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 6, it says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And yeah, everybody will say, oh, that used to say the lion, Mandela effect. No, no, no. The lion with the lamb was a song written in the, I don't remember what, back in the 30s, I think it was. And Elvis Presley on Ed Sullivan's show sang the song, The Lion with the Lamb. And then all the preachers like Billy Goat Graham started putting them in, you know, The Lion with the Lamb in their sermons. And that's what everybody remembers. But the Bible says wolf. It's always said wolf. Unless, of course, you think Satan has a time machine and he go, goes back in time and then he changes the Bible. And really, if you believe that, I mean, doesn't that make God a, a wimp? Unable to preserve his word? Really? Why even bother giving us a Bible if, if it's been changed? Why? What a waste of time. And besides, if, if Satan could go back in time and change the Bible, join the church of Satan. He's obviously more powerful than the Lord. Now, I'm being facetious here, but, you know, that take it to its ultimate conclusion, and that's what it means. Well, Isaiah 11, 6, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Okay? Isaiah 65, 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, like a bull. Uh, have you seen a lion eating straw? Well, last time I checked National Geographic, the lions were hunting gazelles and warthogs and what have you. And uh, I haven't seen them eating straw. So, obviously, this has to be the future. Um, so, do you, uh, do you get the idea? Uh, all right, in Isaiah 11... Uh, you know, in verse 6, it says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. 
and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. You know what an asp is? A deadly sir snake that lives in the Middle East. Bad news. And the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. A uh, cockatrice is some kind of a, it's, it's an old English word. I think it has reference to some kind of a bad snake. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but verse 9, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So obviously, this is the future. You don't see, you know, lions eating straw, but there's going to be little children there. And if we are not in heaven, when resurrected bodies not giving birth, where do these children come from? Well, they got to come from somewhere. So I think that they're the children that died in childbirth, abortions, and what have you. All right, verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Well, who's Jesse? Jesse was the father of King David. And who was the root of Jesse? Christ. Christ created all things including Adam and Eve and uh, everything else in between. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So obviously this is the future. I thought it was Ezekiel, but I was wrong. It's Isaiah. So, all right, let's go back. Bob, you're being long-winded today. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, 2 Peter 3. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. But the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ah, global warming. Here we go. Somebody send Al Gore, or is it Al the Whore, a, uh, uh, a memo. Verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord... But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Well, to the unbelievers, yeah. Not to the believers, because we're going to be looking for the signs. And when people tell you that there's no signs pointing to the second coming, they're deceivers and liars. Whether they're doing it on purpose or because they've been taught wrong that's going to be up to the Lord to decide. But they're deceivers and they're liars and they're wrong. But the day Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Global warming. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Sounds like global warming. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Wherein we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Yeah, you don't want to be spotted with the filth of this word, and you want to be blameless from sin, right? Verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother 
Paul. Oh, yeah. You ever read the book of Corinthians, Ephesians, Thessalonians, Romans? Paul. And there's many that want you to think that Paul is a false apostle. Yeah. Yeah, he's a false apostle to them because Paul represents Christ and those people are not in Christ, my opinion. That's just how I look at it. Because, you know, basically what they're saying is that the Holy Spirit failed, failed, failed to warn the apostles that there was a wolf in their midst named Paul. They're, these people that teach this stuff are devils. And it's very popular now. You'll hear it. You get on the internet long enough in the Christian circles, so-called church circles, and you'll hear, oh, Paul was a false apostle. He preached a different gospel. Ugh, they're idiots. Tell them to go to hell. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord of salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, his letters, speaking them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Yeah, some of the things Paul writes are hard to be understood because Paul was a learned scholar. I'm not. I'm just some guy that's read the Bible a couple of times. But Paul was a learned scholar. Paul knew Greek. Paul knew Hebrew. And he was a Roman citizen. I'll guarantee you he spoke Latin too. He was a scholar. He could read the Bible in the original languages. He was taught at the feet of Gamaliel, a very, very famous scholar in the days of uh, of Christ or around those days I mean I've read some of Gamaliel's works in the Jewish encyclopedia yeah even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you as also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or wrestle, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Wow. You deny Paul, you deny the person that sent Paul, which is Christ. Bad news bears, people. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things, therefore beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. So, back to the article on Forbes, the Harvard thing. Uh, they said that they were spraying things in the air to reflect the sun's rays back out into space to keep the earth from having global warming which i think they're doing this as a cover-up for what they're spraying in the skies and somebody that was a chemist did a saw some like threads falling from the sky and i've seen them too I've seen threads coming down from the sky, especially when I was in Arkansas. Boy, they used to spray the, the heck out of them. Yeah. I mean, they were spraying that all the time. They're little crisscrosses. And let me tell you something. Uh, somebody that was a air traffic controller was saying that all these things were coming from Air Force bases. There must be hundreds of tanker trucks being making deliveries to these bases every single day for them to be spraying all this stuff you know it's got to be but uh he was concerned because he's like these planes are coming from the air force base 
They're making all these patterns over the cities, and then they fly back to the Air Force Base. And sometimes they do them at night, sometimes during the day. Um, you know, they're not really going anywhere. They're just making patterns over the air, you know, over the cities. But this chemist uh, saw threads floating down from the sky. Threads. White and grayish type threads. And they were hanging on the trees. And the guy's like, Where, what the heck is this? Where, where's it coming from? You know, here it is a guy that's been to college in chemistry and lived for a while and never seen anything like it. So he scraped it off the tree and took it to a lab and analyzed it. And uh, aluminum and barium and stronium, which is bad news to breathe this stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I think the um, global warming scam is going to be their cover story so that if there is, if they do get caught, they can say, well, we were trying to save the planet. We were trying. Oh, we the global warming. So, you know. But the thing is, I don't know how many of you watch The Matrix. I never watched The Matrix, but I've seen bits and pieces going over to people's houses. But there was a, uh, a cartoon on The Matrix. I watched that for a little while. Basically, artificial intelligence machines took over. Uh, you know, like the Terminator movie. Now, the Terminator movie 1 and 2, I did watch those. Oh, yeah. I thought Terminator 1 and 2 were two of the best movies I'd ever seen in my life. I, I enjoyed them. I really did. But what's the theme? The machines take over. Well, in The Matrix, um, especially in the cartoon, uh, mankind knew that the machines were using solar panels for... Um, their energy source to charge their batteries. So they got this bright idea, hey, let's block out the sun so they can't do that. Well, blocking out the sun, is this a good idea? Well, guess what? Uh, where do you get vitamin D from? Well, vitamin D, uh, you get it when the sun is on your skin. Your body can convert sunlight uh, use vitamin, I'm sorry, your body can use the sunlight's energy to convert, uh, to produce or convert vitamin D for your body. Vitamin D is essential for calcium to be absorbed for your bones. And, you know, that's why people, when they get older, uh, they start losing their blunt bone mass. And then they, you know, break hips and bones, you know, their bones get brittle. Well, that and the fluoride in the water, um, that's another thing. And, uh, yeah, I know all about fluoride since I worked in water treatment for 15 years. That stuff's nasty, people. We had a leak on one of our pumps, and it ate a hole in the concrete and the steel. Steel reinforced rebarb, rebar ate a hole in it. Well, guess what concrete's made out of? Calcium. What are your bones made out of? Calcium. What do you think fluoride does to your bones? Yeah. So, you know, they're, uh, if we don't have the Lord's protection and we're not obedient, uh, they're, they're killing us. But, but the Matrix got the great idea. Hey, let's spray stuff in the skies and block out the sunlight. And then the machines will uh, have no way to power themselves. Well, so they sprayed the skies. So you don't have vitamin D being produced in your skin. Okay, you can't absorb calcium. But another thing is too, uh, how do plants grow? Oh, photosynthesis, sunlight, right? What happens when you block out the sun? The plants don't grow. You don't have any food. I mean, are these people insane? 
Are they sick? Yeah, they are. Well, Jesus called them the children of the devil in John chapter 8. Yeah. And I guess they're just following the will of their father, you know, and they're probably possessed of devils and demons don't need to eat, do they? I don't think so. I mean, if they do, the Bible doesn't tell me. So what do they care about their human hosts? They don't, I guess. I don't know. So that was the thing about the Matrix. Now, I hate teaching all this gloom and doom stuff, but Luke 12, 32. Jesus said, Fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In Acts 14, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had adorned and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Wow, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Somebody send the pre-tribbers a memo because they don't get it. You know, they think that the Antichrist are God's chosen people. You know, the people that deny Jesus. Yeah, there's a whole group of them over in the Middle East. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to believe that they're God's chosen people, like John Hagee, uh, you go for it, girl or guy. You know, you go for it. But I don't believe that. Personally, I think Christians are God's chosen people. I think he's chosen us, chosen us in the election before the foundation of the world. Hey, I read that somewhere. Oh, that's right. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Oh, that's Paul. Yeah, Paul wrote that. Now, are you, you know, let's read this. According as he hath chosen us in him, who's he? The Lord. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Wow. Now you know why they hate Paul? Yeah. That's why they hate Paul. Because Paul tells it like it is. Now, they want you to think that, um, you know, if uh, Satan changes his mind and decides to, you know, say his 30-second sinner's prayer, he, Satan's going to get saved. There's actually people that teach that. They're called Unitarians. Yeah. They think that uh, Esau, Edom, is going to get saved. All he has to do is believe and, and love, you know, believe the Lord. Uh, but the Bible doesn't teach that. No, it sure doesn't. I think I'm going to make this a part two, and I think I'm going to make a part three because I haven't even touched on the mark being spiritual and or physical, or, you know. I haven't even touched on it hardly. So, uh, boy, I'm doing a lot of weird stuff here. Yeah, I know. So, all right, well, this is going to be part two. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.